Hi, everybody. Welcome to the very first edition of the UC San Francisco Coast podcast. I'm your host, Samantha Schilf, the executive director of Coast, which is short for the Center for Obesity Assessment, Study, and Treatment. And I'm the producer of this podcast. I'm really excited to be talking with you today via this podcast, which is a brand new vehicle for us here at Coast to share with you the latest research that's coming out of our obesity center. Coast is home to more than 30 of UCSS leading experts on obesity research, diet and nutrition, and health policy. And I'm happy to say that I'm sitting here with one of them, Dr. Alyssa Eppel, who is the director of Coast. She's going to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about the obesity center that she started here at UCSF. Thank you so much, Samantha. I'm a professor here at UCSF in the Department of Psychiatry and also here at the Center for Health and Community. And I've been studying stress and obesity pretty much my whole career for almost 25 years. And there is still so much to learn about how stress and obesity interact with each other. The Coast Center brings together interdisciplinary researchers to really tackle this intersection between stress and obesity, as well as understanding sugar and how that plays a role in our metabolism, in our individual health, in the obesity epidemic. So we have been meeting for over a decade at Coast, and our goal at this point in time in history is to leverage the amazing science we have for social change. So really bringing in um, policymakers and trying to understand how the science can actually be leveraged. Thanks so much, Alyssa. It's really a wonderful thing that we get to do this today, especially since we have two very special people joining us for our first broadcast. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about Dr. Kelly Brownell and his daughter, Christy? Mm, right. We, we certainly have an intergenerational team. So Kelly was my graduate school advisor several decades ago. And one remarkable thing about Kelly is he empowered all of his students to think big. He does transformative science. You can see that in his own path, his own legacy. He inspires people around him. And he asks the hardest questions of the most relevant fields around him about how to tackle different public health epidemics. So you'll hear more about how he is trying to reverse the obesity epidemic when he gives his keynote in our lecture this year. Now, I get to work with Christy Brownell, who is his daughter. She's a young emerging scholar in public health. And I wanted to hear what Christy's frank questions are for Kelly. Well, Dr. Brownell and Christy were kind enough to let us join them for a casual but unique father-daughter talk focusing on some of the most pressing world food issues that we face today and what we can do to create a brighter future for our health and food. Here they are. We hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Christy Brownell, and I'm here as a researcher from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and I'm here to interview Dr. Kelly Brownell, who is the Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. Um, and a pioneer in the field of public health and public policy research. And he also happens to be my dad. <laughs> it's so much fun to be here with you, Christy. And, you know, of all the, the, uh, the titles you just mentioned, the one dad is most important to me. Thanks, Dad. So I guess we want to start with the big picture and what you see as the most pressing world food issues. Boy, there are a bunch of them. Um, at the same time, Hunger is growing as a world problem. Obesity is growing as a world problem. There are huge strains on the agriculture system. And you know, the, well, the world population is going to grow a lot in the upcoming 50 years. And they're really pressing questions about whether we can feed all those people. And if we do, at what cost? What environmental cost? And what cost to human health? Mm -hmm. So it's really important that the world get these things right. And you could take any one piece of it, like food insecurity and hunger, or you could take obesity, or you could take agriculture and environment, any one of them by themselves is really important. 
But when you put them all together, then it really is important. So the, it, we need to get the policy right. There needs to be a research base for it. And it's the world is paying attention to this, but not enough. Mm -hmm. And so more and more people need to come in and join the effort and try to create the evidence base for making good decisions. Yeah, I mean, you've told me in the past that the idea for the World Food Policy Center came about because of limitations in your field, some of which you just said, but can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so for many years, um, especially when I was uh, at Yale University, I was doing work on just obesity prevention and public health nutrition, and that was really exciting, but it became pretty clear to me through teaching and work with, with colleagues that there were things going on in other parts of the world that were affecting uh, what was going on in the obesity world, like trade policies mm -hmm. and egg subsidy policies and all these sort of things would affect fundamental things like the availability and cost of food. That would affect what people have access to and their risk of becoming overweight. So it was important to know that, but my field never taught me to even think about those things. Yeah. And so there were deficits in my own knowledge. I set out to try to correct those by meeting as many people as I could and reading. I couldn't really do my job in my field unless I knew what was going on in these other areas. And that was the impetus for creating the World Food Policy Center. So the idea of the center is not to recreate depth on any one topic, but right. to be a bridge across them. So we're, we have four broad areas that we're covering. One is hunger, malnutrition, food insecurity. The second is obesity and chronic disease. The third is a very large category of agriculture and environment, and that includes biodiversity, climate, water change. And then the last category is food safety and defense. And we think we can go, you know, get to the goal a lot faster if you have collaboration across these fields rather than just everybody working in their individual areas. Mm -hmm. So we want to be the glue or be the bridge. And there are a few other places around the world trying to do this, but not much. And so there's a real need for it. That's great. And when are you planning on starting this process? Well, we're still pretty early in the thinking about this. We've done convenings of world food policy leaders. We've had people from places like the World Health Organization and the World Bank and the White House and the Council on Foreign Relations, a lot of other people work with us on what the center might look like. Mm -hmm. But we've just now launched, and we're very excited about a couple of things in particular we're going to do. One is we want to create a global network of people who are working on food policy, mm -hmm. a digital network, so that people can find ways of interacting with one another easily. And then we also want to uh, do some things locally so we can uh, learn what's happening in these food systems in our backyard. So mm -hmm. Duke University is in Durham, North Carolina. So one of our major projects is to work with the city of Durham to try to create a model food system city. And then we'll have a rural county counterpart with this as well. So the question is, can you take one place in the country and try to get everything right? Mm -hmm. You try to intervene across these areas so that simultaneously you're addressing obesity, you're addressing food insecurity, you're addressing environment, food safety issues, mm -hmm. and you set up a series of best practices, programs, and policies that will help make this happen. So we've had great collaboration from people in Durham and in the, the city and county governments and from the local educational institutions and hospitals and things like that. So we're very optimistic about trying to make this work. We're still early, but we're excited about the prospects we're... It sounds so fascinating. We're very excited about it. And there's been so much excitement about yeah. around local, uh, the local community on this. You know, just take the faith-based community, for example. There's a whole group of people at Duke and the Divinity School who care deeply about these food issues. And they care about them partly because they're, um, they're interested in theology and food, mm -hmm. like stewardship of the, the Earth's resources and how you nurture fellow humans and things like that. But they're also very interested in churches as a place to deliver food assistance. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole thing that most people don't think too much about when you're doing you know, obesity prevention, for example. So it's really nice to engage all these different players in the community. We learn a lot from them. They're really nice people. They're working hard and doing good work. And we think if all this can come together into a coherent whole, it'll be more than just scattered uh, things that are going on now that, that tend not to connect with each other. Have you seen any kind of collaborative projects in other fields that are similar that you could draw from? Or is this really the first? There are some. Uh, in the public health arena, there are some very interesting collaborative things that have gone on in tobacco, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the people that are doing programs to try to reduce people's use of tobacco 
have connected with the policy world and worked on things like tobacco taxes and clean indoor air laws and things like that. So that's been a very interesting model. But there are many other examples. For example, there's a this wonderful researcher at Johns Hopkins University named Al Somer mm -hmm. who discovered that vitamin A deficiency was causing blindness and other problems in developing countries. And after the initial research where they documented the deficiency was causing the problems, they then did some small trials of trying to supplement the diet with vitamin A. And they found that if they got great results from that, then they did larger scale trials. And then, then they went right to the politicians to try to get these things done on a broad scale. So now all around the world, vitamin A supplementation is being done. And they're, they're saving millions and millions of lives and preventing uncountable a number of cases of blindness. And that's because they've gone all the way from the basic research to the policy. And in order to do that, because none of us can be good at all those things, you have to collaborate. Plus, it's just a lot of fun to Absolutely. learn from them. So that's what makes this project so special. If we can collaborate effectively, it'll work. If we can, it won't. And so those human <laughs> interactions that are part of establishing trust and developing relationships and valuing what you can learn from other people is really important. Yeah, I agree. I think in a lot of the research that I've done, I found most impactful the time that I've gotten to work directly with students and with parents and children facing food insecurity issues and really hearing their stories firsthand. Um, and I think that so often the research can be removed from that, um, where we're just working in a lab, we're working in our offices, we're working with other researchers. Um, it's so important to bring those people to the table and I wonder if how you guys are going to be doing that when you're working on this new case in Durham. So let me start by asking you a question because one thing I really like about the work you've done is you've spent a lot of time out there in the community mm -hmm. meeting with families and teachers and kids and then you were in AmeriCorps and you spent a lot of time doing that, uh, you know, working in a school and things. So what did you, what kind of things did you learn from that that researchers might not know just sitting in their offices reading journal articles? Yeah, I think that really you just need to engage because um, you're going to have your own opinions about the work that you're doing and you're going to see it going in a specific way, in a specific direction, but um, that can sometimes be a different direction than the people who are being most affected by it, a different direction than they want to go. So I think every time that you can, every chance that you get, engage those people and ask them questions and see what their food access issues are and see where their stress is coming from. Ask them how they feel about the food environment in which they live and you'll have a much brighter picture of what you should do, I think, after. I agree with you entirely and it's something that researchers traditionally haven't paid a lot of attention to, but now they're starting to. And you see it come up in different ways. Um, People like, like us, for example, we're, we're spending a lot more time collaborating with ethnographic researchers. You know, people that get out in the communities and mm -hmm. spend time living with the, the people who, who you're interested in, in, in working with. And they learn a tremendous amount from that that connects with the research in mm -hmm. nice ways. It's not either or, but the two connect in nice ways. So we're, we're big believers in that, and we want to do it by collaborating with ethnographic researchers, using human-centered design principles to draw together people in interesting ways and have them out in the community learning from people. And I think from that we'll gain a lot richer knowledge of what ultimately we might do. I wonder if you have any ideas of how we can do similar work here all throughout California, but using San Francisco as an example. Well, so. San Francisco or, you know, really about any place in California is where you'd expect something like this to happen Absolutely. because there's so much interest in food and health and public health and all those sort of things. And there's so many resources, so many amazing people out here working on these things. And of course, California usually goes first when it comes to the public policy things that protect the public. Um, you know, I was um, mentioning earlier that Berkeley was the first place in the, the U.S. to pass a soda tax and the, the soda companies were very quick to dismiss this, saying that Berkeley was an outlier. And my response was Berkeley wasn't an outlier, Berkeley was a forecaster, because yeah. Berkeley was the first place in the country, as I recall, to put cutouts and sidewalks for wheelchairs and to have clean indoor air laws mm -hmm. and things like that. And so those, a lot of these things start in California. So if there's any place in the country where this is likely to happen and happen well, it would be in California. And then, of course, you've got the, the university, the University of California mm -hmm. system, 
that has a lot of people working on food. There's a special food initiative that's happening from the chancellor's office. People across campuses working together. Mm -hmm. And I think that provides a tremendous opportunity for good work to happen in California. We'd love to collaborate with the people out here on those things. Yeah, that would be great. I think that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. I know people really want to know what we can do to change these things, not just as a researcher, but as a young person um, going into a career and people outside of the field, what can we do? There's so many ways to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And people tend to think like there's one career path to doing this. And I, I, I work with students all the time who want career advice to do I go into this field or that field. Mm -hmm. And you know, for example, if you're interested in food issues, you could go to law school, you could go to business school, you could go to med school, you could get a PhD in nutrition or psychology, or there's so many different things you could do. Right. And people say, well, what should I do? And I say, well, pick the discipline that, you've, that feels best to you, and then you can make a difference within that field. Because if I look at people who are leading our field, there are people from all those backgrounds that I just mentioned. So pick something you love, stick with it, and then you can make a difference, especially if you love what you do. Yeah. Um, the, but also I wanted to make the point that it's amazing how people can make differences as individuals. Mm -hmm. People don't often think about that, but for example, I've seen a parent um, very interested in the health and well-being of their child uh, mobilize a school system by just setting up a meeting with the principal, then with the superintendent, then getting some other parents into a coalition. And all of a sudden, the school board's listening, and all of a sudden, the school starts changing its policies. Doesn't matter what professional training that individual, that parent had. Mm -hmm. It was just that they were a parent who, who took the time to stand up. And it's amazing how often those individual efforts at the local level can matter and can become contagious in a good way because you do it in your system, school system, and then the next school system hears about it, and mm -hmm. their parents get going on it, and uh, people really can make a big difference that way. Of course you can make a difference by, if you're a lawyer, by taking legal action, or if you're a researcher, right. by creating evidence base. There's so many different professional things you can do, but you can also make a big difference as a citizen, and people do have a voice, and that's especially true at local levels, and so much of the ingenuity starts at local levels, not at the federal government level. Mm -hmm. And then it, go, it goes up, it percolates up to state levels and ultimately the federal government. That that's really where a lot of it starts. And people, if they're just passionate about something, they care deeply about it, it's amazing what they can get done. You've been so optimistic throughout your career and as a father. I wonder what your advice is to me as a daughter for how to move forward in the field. Well, I'm very optimistic about the future, and for you in particular, I love your creativity, your passion for things, your curiosity, and your wanting to make the world better. And it's people like that that really do make the world better. So I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that and happy for it. And the fact that you're not the only one in your generation who feels that way, I think, uh, leads us to be optimistic. You know, they care more about where the food comes from, who grew it, what its carbon footprint was, was it local, does it help farmers, all these kind of things are questions that your generation asks. And that is a very good sign for the future. So I'm really hopeful and excited about the future, both for you in particular, but for your generation overall. Thanks, Dad. You're welcome.